Everybody ready? <laughs> All right, everybody ready for some algebra lessons? <laughs> yeah, you thought you would never go back to algebra, huh? I know. Um, but this is a different uh, kind of algebra. This is a much more abstract algebra. And I, I don't know, but I, I really like the more abstract things because these more practical things are, seem harder, like uh, solving equations, you know, with many variables and doing coordinate transformations. I mean, this is all algebra, this sort of uh, high school algebra or beyond high school algebra. Um, what, what I want to talk about is, is, is the more uh, abstract algebra that's uh, useful in programming. I mean, the other kind of algebra is also useful in programming, but also in, in these niches where, where you actually have to solve equations or do some physics simulations, stuff like this. So, so here, um, well, first of all, there is a big, oh, am I crossing the line here? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is like outside of the, um, um, so, um, so algebraic data types, for instance, there is a big uh, area in, in, in functional programming, all data types start with algebraic data types, uh, right, and, and like the C++ guys or Java guys, they miss this, this part, it's like there is no, general classification of data types, like you cannot really abstract over, uh, I want something that will work for every data type, you know, like serialization, for instance. How do I serialize any data type? But, but what is any data type? There are so many possible data types, right? It seems like in, in uh, uh, imperative languages, there are so many ways of creating data types. And in functional languages, this is all classified nicely using an algebra of data types. And then there are these recursive data types, you know, like, like lists, trees, and so on. They are also used in, in, uh, in, in every language. You have lists, linked lists, and, and you have trees, and so on. But the, uh, the approach to these things is always, uh, okay, so we have these pointers, right? We start with pointers. Okay, so how do we do with this stuff with pointers and operator new and so on? It's like very low-level engineering uh, approach. Um, whereas in functional languages, this is, this is, there is a more general uh, abstract approach to these things. And, and then I want, want to talk about them mostly about, about how to do computations uh, of, um, on algebraic data types. So let's, let's talk about what, what, what an algebra is. Uh, so there are two parts to algebra, you know, after, after you like uh, get rid of all the details or the X's, Y's and Z's and, and so on, uh, you, you find out that out of all these algebras that, that people use in mathematics, there are like two major ideas that, that are common to all the algebras. And one of them is the ability to form expressions, okay? So we form expressions using things like operators, numbers, and symbols, like an example, x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. That, that's an expression, right? And it contains all these elements. Uh, but why do we have to restrict ourselves to just plus minus? Why do we have to restrict ourselves to numbers and what are these uh, x's, y's, and, and z's? Do they have to be something really special or can we just like go crazy and abstract this stuff to make it something extremely general? And yes, we can. But the other part of the algebra is evaluation. We want to be able, if you have an expression, we want to be able to evaluate an expression, right? So like if we substitute x and y in, in, this, in this expression, we want to be able to do the calculation and actually get a result. Like in this case, the result is n a number, four, right? So these two parts, being able to 
uh, create expressions, and the other part is evaluating these expressions. And these things appear uh, in all these examples from classical algebra, from, from high school algebra, addition, multiplication. You can have vectors, you can operate on vectors. You have inner products, outer products, and so on. And each of them is very specific, specialized, but they all fit into this um, beautiful schema where you have expressions and evaluation. So let's start with expressions. So we would like to ask the question, of course, like functional programmers always start with, what is it, right? What is the essence of, of something? <clears throat> so what is the essence of, of an expression? Um, and, and we start with an example. Of course, first we ask a very general question and then go into immediately into examples. Um, so in order to create, to be able to construct expressions, we need some kind of grammar, right? That's how we construct these things. So we need a grammar for building expressions. And it turns out that this, this grammar can be very nicely, and th this is Haskell, but in any other language, uh, you, you can do this. It's harder because, in, like in C++, you would have to use pointers and trees and so on. In Haskell, it's a very, very simple translation. This, this looks like BNF notation, right? Uh, but it's actually Haskell. Uh, it's, it's Haskell code. So I'm defining this data type expression, right? And, and I have three possible types of expressions. There are three possible kinds of expressions, it's not types, it's one type, uh, kinds of expressions. I can construct expressions by uh, creating a, a leaf expression, essentially, because this is a tree, right? I mean, everybody sees that it's a tree. Huh? A leaf is a const, const is the constructor here, and takes an integer, okay? Or if I already have two expressions, I can combine them using this constructor add and another constructor for multiplication. So I'm just creating these nodes that whose children are expressions and so on. So this is a grammar. This is also a data type. And there's this connection between grammar and data types that's, that's very, very nice. Right? Now one thing about this um, data type is that it's recursive, right? I mean, I'm defining an expression and I'm already using it inside the definition of expression. So it's a recursive definition. And uh, we'll have to like, try to figure out um, wh what does it really mean to, to have this kind of recursion, right? But, but we want expressions to be recursive. We want to have infinitely many possible expressions. Right? We, we don't want to just end up with two possible expressions, that is, that's it. Right? It wouldn't be a very interesting algebra. Algebra has to have these, these infinite possibilities of creating new expressions. <coughs> so this is an example that really looks like an expression, right? But in general, this is also a data type. So what's the relationship between expressions and algebraic expressions and data types? And it turns out that you can have algebraic data types. And algebraic data types are um, constructed using very similar building blocks. Actually, these are, this is the use of these building blocks in, in constructing data types. So <clears throat> algebraic data types uh, are constructed using some basic building blocks and some ways of combining these basic building blocks. And this is true about every algebraic data type, not only expression. But in our particular case, we're building expressions using this. So, so the, the, there, there are these, like, let's, let's start actually from the bottom here, the most complex ones, because they, these are the easiest, easiest to understand. So we have these two product and sum types. A product type is a type that contains both types that are used to form it, right? So if you have a product of an integer and a string, it, the product will contain both an integer and a string. That's why it's called a product, okay? So it's like, like Boolean and, right? 
sort of like multiplication, so that's why it's called. So, so it contains both of these, then the simplest representation, oh, it's a pair of these two types, right? So give me an integer, give me a string, I'll give you a pair, right? So a pair is a product type. Um, you, can, uh, you, you can pair together more things and you can have these tuples, which have, you have all three things or, f or four types in, in one area and in fact uh, if you if you just keep adding t to these tuples then eventually you, you kind of get lost and and you have to give them names so that you know not this third component a 15th component of my tuple but it's it's a component called salary and name and stuff like this so all structures all records they are examples of product types Okay, so you use product types everywhere in programming. In every language you have product types. You also have some types, but they are not as used as often in uh, um, other languages. In, in Haskell, use them all over the place. <clears throat> but an example of, of, of a, I mean, a sum is, is, is a tagged union, which means it contains either this type or that type. And it has a tag which says, I contain this type. And another value will say, no, I'm this type, right? I'm either an integer or a string. And I have a tag, so if you can, you can check. I got a value of this type. Uh -huh. Is it an integer or a string? You can ask it, right? I mean, we do it, in Haskell, we do it by pattern matching. So here's an example. Uh, of uh, a type called either um, that it takes two types a and a prime in Haskell you can put primes on, on variables and it's kind of nice notation and and this means or this is red or so it's either a and the constructor is called left so that's the tag it says left and it's of type a or it's a right and it's of type a prime Okay. So you can ha you can have these things in, in you have you can have tagged unions and variants in in C plus plus on or in um, Java, right? So these these are the combinators in which you take some types and you combine them in, into higher order types, right? And and they look very much like like some kind of algebra. This is multiplication, this is addition, right? Some types, product types. <clears throat> then you can, you, can, you can have these leaves uh, of, of the trees and, and the leaf of a tree could be uh, parameterized by some type, you know, like if you have, you have parametric types, you have uh, generic types. So you can say, okay, uh, uh, A is, is the type that I'm using to parameterize my type, right? like a template of class T or template of T in, in Java, right? Um, then you can have something that, that uh, kind of in, injects a, a particular type into your data structure, like an int or a string, right? And you can look at it also as something that's parameterized by some uh, arbitrary type, but it just ignores this part arbitrary type that's why it's called const. It just takes, you know, uh, two types and, and ignores one of them. It's, it's a way of looking at uh, a construction of, of new types based on some other type, right? And finally, you have this unit type uh, in Haskell, uh, uh, a singleton type that has only va one value and that corresponds in, uh, in C++, roughly speaking, to void, okay? And it also could be represented as, as a const whose first type is, is unit. So these are the basic blocks of algebraic data types. And, and you can see that the type that we started with, the expression, is, is actually built using these uh, building blocks, right? So it has these three elements and they are combined using the or, right? So th this is a variant, 
right? Or, or a sum type, right? And it has three possibilities. One is, is this const thing that injects an integer into my data structure. So I, I'm ignoring whatever type you are passing me. I'm just uh, putting integer in there. Or you can have m multiplication of two types, and you, have, you can have ad addition node that also takes two. Uh, it, it takes one type, really, right? It's, it's just that both children of, of this uh, are of the same type, A, right? And, and they are expressions, actually. This is where the, the induction um, enters. Um, and, and this is an example of a product type. It's a product of A with A. It's a sort of like a square, right? Product of the type with itself. So this is a square and this is a square, okay? But what about recursion, right? We have algebraic data types, and, and, but, but our expression is really recursive. Um, can we kind of define recursion algebraically? And it turns out that recursion can be defined algebraically, that can be separated from the definition of our data type. We can say this data type actually um, has two components, okay? There is non-recursive component and there is recursion. We can separate these two things. That's, that's a very, very nice thing. And the non-recursive part of this is when we replace the expressions here, the recursive call to expression, right? If we replace it with an arbitrary type parameter, okay? And then we have something that's non-recursive. And this something that's non-recursive, but it depends on the type parameter, is called a functor, okay? And this is something from category theory, but you don't have to, you know, it's just a functor is a mapping of types. So give me a type A, and I call this X per F f for functor, okay? It's not the same expression as before. This is more primitive because it's not, not recursive. But instead of being recursive, it's polymorphic. It's generic. It's generic in this A, okay? So it takes a parameter, type parameter A. That's a type. I can put any type in there. And I will have a, um, either a const integer which does not depend on this type, or I can have the product of this type with itself, add AA or mal AA, okay? So I'm, I'm creating a, here a generic data type, and I got rid of recursion. But in, instead of recursion, I have my variable there, right? Like when you define recursive functions, you know, you can define a function that takes a variable and then like if you want to do recursion, you will put this function calling itself, right? And then calling itself and so on. That's the recursion. Um, but why is this thing called a functor? Because a functor is a thing that has two, uh, again, two components. One is this mapping of types. So it's, a, it's called a type constructor because I'm constructing a type from type A. I'm constructing a new, more complex type that sort of looks like a tree, but it only has one level, right? It doesn't have children. The children of, of this tree are this arbitrary type A. There is no recursion, right? So it's a mapping of types, but also a mapping of functions. What does it mean? It means that I can take any function that operates on A, like a function that takes an A and returns a B, and I can get this function and operate on A inside my data structure, right? So it goes under this X per F and operates on A's which are there. So how is this defined? This, and and this, this, this operation of, of acting with a function on the contents of a functor is called FMAP in, in Haskell. Right? So fmap takes a function from A to B, takes, takes this x per f, so this, this, this kind of uh, 
one level tree and produces an expert F of B with the type A substituted with type B, right? Because I have a function that turns A's into B's, turns integers into strings, for instance. So I have an expression in which A was integer, I'll get an expression in which A is a string. Okay? Yeah, I can do this. And how do I do this? Well, I have three cases. My, um, my uh, data value can either be a const, an add, or a mul. So I'll define all three cases. If it's a const integer, then I do nothing. Okay? I, I leave it. Uh, because it doesn't depend on type A at all. But if it's uh, an add or a mul, it has some values of type A in them, right? And I can act on these values with F. I can go under add and, and act with F on X and Y. So F will take uh, an A, type A, and turn it into type B. And same here. So now I will have an add of two B's from two A's. So that's what I wanted, right? I wanted to operate under the hood. And now for the recursion part, okay? Now recursion can be defined by applying this functor to itself. So like my, my functor tells me how to uh, create one level trees. I, I call it a tree, although it's not really a tree, right? I mean, it's, it's like, it's a structure or something. Uh, one level trees. Um, but I can, but, but since it's a, it's a functor, it takes a type parameter A, and this A can be anything. And in particular, it could be X per F of A. Because that's also a type, right? So I'm substituting this x per f of a as my type parameter. And now I have an expression uh, that whose children are these one-level expressions. So I have a two-level tree now. But I can continue this. I can substitute this a with x per f of a. Now I have three-level trees, right? I mean, some of these will be leaves, so fine, right? But some of them will be nodes that have children. I'm substituting these children with my, my, my type. And I can go on like this and on and on, right? So what if I do it infinitely many times, okay? So I get trees of depth, I define trees of depth one, two, three, blah, 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 infinity. So how do I know that I reached infinity, okay? I know that I reached infinity if one more application of x per f to it will change nothing. It's like adding one to infinity, right? If you add one to infinity, you still get infinity, right? So if I have an infinitely deep tree and I make it a child of, of another one level tree, I still get an infinitely deep, deep tree. And the funny thing is that you can express this property in Haskell as a data type. I mean, it's sort of like an equation, and, but, but it, it can be expressed as a, as a data type. And it's called fixed point, right? So a fixed point is when, when, you, when you are applying a function uh, to an argument uh, multiple times and you find um, that, that uh, there is one point for which the application of, of this function does not move this, this point, right? There are other points that when you apply a function, they, they get moved, right? And this is one fixed point which when you apply the function, it doesn't. So, so by analogy here, you apply this functor one more time and doesn't move it. It's already infinite. Right? So here, f stands not for a function, it stands for an arbitrary functor. In our case, this, this functor was, was this uh, x per f.
but it could be any functor, any functor. You can apply it multiple times, multiple times, and get, eventually you get to infinity. And when you get, you, when you apply it infinitely many times, then it will have this property that fix f, that's the fixed point data type, when you apply f once more to fix f, you get back fix f, right? So applying f to fix f does not change anything because it's already this infinite tree. So you know that you are defining an inf infinite tree when one more application of the functor doesn't change anything. And this is expressed as a data type. Really, a data type is nothing else but a function on types, right? And in this case, it's a function that takes a function on, on type again. So it's like a function on function on types. There are things that you can express in Haskell. I, I, I don't know. Um, you, can, you can express this stuff in, in other languages too, but in C++ you would have to use like template template parameter, right? Because a template template parameter is like a function on types. And you get a template that takes a template template parameter. You have a function on function on types. So it, it's all possible, but it's, it's, it's much nicer in, in Haskell. So let's go back to our expression, right? So we have this functor, this particular functor that takes type A and creates this, this one level tree, right? And now we apply the fix to this. And notice I'm applying fix to X per F. X per F itself is a function on types. I'm not putting A here. Very important because if I put A here, then I already get a type. X per F is a function on types. It's a functor. So I'm trying to find a fixed point of a function on types, right? So this is a different definition. It's the same as this. this these two things are totally equivalent. The difference is that this contains both things. It contains the flat data structure, the f my functor, and infinite recursion, right? Whereas here, I was able to split it into two separate components, and I can deal with them separately. And this will become important when I start evaluating my expressions, that I can do this separately. So let's talk about evaluation, okay? And of course, since we are functional programs, we'll start with the question, what is evaluation, right? What is evaluation? Evaluation is extracting a value from an expression, right? So you have to have some procedure of, that takes an expression and extracts a value. But there can be many ways of evaluating the same expression, right? So here's one way of evaluating my expression that uses integers. It says, uh, okay, so I will, when, when I have in the node add, I will just add two integers and I will get an integer. If I have a node multiply, I will multiply two integers and get an integer again, okay? That's one way of uh, evaluating this expression. But there is another way of evaluating this expression which evaluates to strings. I'm saying, okay, uh, how do I evaluate the leaf? It has an integer in it, right? I can turn this integer, this is a way of turning an integer into a character, right? I take this character and I make it into a one, one character list, which is a string. So I have a way of turning an integer into a string, one character string. Okay, so that's my leaf. Now when I have add, I will just concatenate these two strings. My children are strings now, right? And multiply, I will just do all possible combinations of these, of characters from these strings and create one huge string that like, contains all possible permutations of these, of these two guys. And that's a good definition. And then maybe there is another one. I, I haven't written it because I don't know how to implement it, but <laughs> you know, it's like, they're hidden behind these, or like complex numbers, or vectors, or matrices, or whatever. 
the, the, same, the same expression can be interpreted with different types. Because my expression was originally defined in terms of a functor that takes an arbitrary type. So if I set this type to int, I have an expression that contains integers, and I can evaluate it using integer arithmetic. If I set this a to be string, then I have an expression of, with strings, and I can say, oh, this is how I evaluate expression with strings, and so on. I can define these things um, at my convenience, right? So, so this thing, uh, there are two things that I'm doing when I'm evaluating. First, I'm fixing my type in my functor. I'm saying, okay, I have this functor exp, x per f that depends on a. I'm fixing it to be an int. And that's called my, my carrier type. Once I fix it, I'm saying my carrier type is int. And the other thing is I'm providing this function, this evaluation here, that's really a function that takes an, an x per f and returns me a value, right? And that's the definition of an f algebra. This is like the most abstract way of defining an algebra with a functor. In our case, that was x per f, that was a functor. A type, which we call the carrier type, like an int, for instance, or a string. And then I have to have this function that evaluates, and I'll call this algebra. I call this function algebra, okay? You often just say this function is really algebra because that contains the most information. But really, the algebra is the functor, the carrier type, and this function. This function takes an x per f of int, in our case, of carrier type, and returns the carrier type. So it evaluates an expression of int to an int. I can have another algebra that takes an x per f of string and evaluates to string, and so on. x per f of complex that evaluates to complex. Okay? But it's always x per f of some type evaluating to that type to the carrier type, okay? And in fact, in, in, in Haskell, you can, you can, again, you can define algebra as this abstract data type, da data type that depends on a functor f, which is a function on types, and some type a, the carrier type, and its definition contains just this function, right? This function from fa to a. That's the evaluation function. That's, that's, that's the essence of the algebra, the evaluation. But, but notice that this, this evaluation here, that, that, that only tells me how to evaluate one-level trees, right? This, uh, it can either evaluate an ad whose children are already ints, right? Or it can evaluate a leaf to an int, okay? What if I want to evaluate the recursive expressions, the whole tree, okay? And it turns out that I can do that. So the problem uh, I'm posing is given type A, the carrier type, and this function, FA to A, I want to evaluate an expression given by fix F. Fix F is my whole tree. Takes this functor F, fixes it and generates a data type that's no longer parameterized by any type. It's just a, 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 an infinite, possibly, well, it's not an infinite tree, but it's, it's an infinite set of deeper and deeper trees, right? And this, in our example, this would be uh, given alg, which is x per f of int to int, so this evaluation of one level tree right, with a carrier type, in this case int, and I want to evaluate the full expression, the one that I defined in the beginning, but now I'm, a, I'm, I'm defining this expression as a fix of x per f. Okay. 
And how do we do this? It's called a catamorphism. That's what we do. <laughs> so, so let's look at fix, what fix does, right? Fix um, has this constructor called in that uh, applies the functor f to fix f. Fix f are these children, which are also trees, right? But I'm applying this functor f to these trees. So I have one level of the stuff, right? And the children are full-blown trees. But these children are always smaller than my whole tree, right? And that's, that's why I can actually do this evaluation. Now, I can define a function unfixed. That's, that's a kind of ar artificial thing. Uh, it, it means I want to uh, undo the constructor. So I, want, I, have a f I have an expression that is fix of, of the functor. I want to get out from what's inside this fix because it's encapsulated in this constructor. So it, it's, it's a trivial thing. Like if, if I pattern match in of something, then re give me this something that's in the, in the expression, right? So, if I have a fix f expression and I want to evaluate it, then there are three steps. First is, I want to get what's inside the stuff. So, what's inside of the stuff is my functor acting on children, the in, the, the, these other subtrees, right? Now, I want to evaluate these children, but I have functor with children, right? And I have something to evaluate stuff. I'll call this stuff that I, um, that I evaluate, I call it kata. Kata is this function that I am defining right now, but obviously I have to define this function recursively. So I will use the function I'm defining Okay, to evaluate the children of my one level, my functor, right? So how do I do it? I, I have this F map that lets me get under, right? So I will get under using F map. So I will evaluate the children using F map of my kata of algebra. Right? So I'm defining this kata, which takes an algebra and takes a fixed f, the full-blown expression, and returns me the value of type A. Right? So kata of algebra is this part, and it knows how to evaluate these children. But the, and, and remember, these children are smaller than my whole tree. This is why this process terminates eventually. So I'm getting smaller and smaller trees to evaluate, right? Eventually, I hit the leaves, which I know how to evaluate, right? So I'm just going, descending, descending. So once I F map all these children, then suddenly I have a tree which is one level. It's a one level, it's a functor acting on what? On whatever kata algebra returns, and it returns A. So now I have a functor uh, whose children are of type A. And I know how to evaluate. I just apply alg to it. So, because alg is something that takes this functor of my carrier type and gives me back my carrier type. So it will take an expression uh, x per f of int and will give me an int. It will do the addition, multiplication of the children, but the children are, have been evaluated already by this guy. So if I put all of this together, then the catamorphism, okay, is just a combination of these three things. And, and you read it from right to left. Unfix, so that I get rid of this outer in uh, constructor. So I, I, what, what it gives me is the functor acting on big expressions. Then I F map kata alge on it, so I evaluate all these children using my catamorphism that I am defining. And finally, I'm 
applying ALGE to evaluate the top level, where children are already have, has, have been already evaluated and I only have to do simple arithmetic on them. Right? And I get back my value. So here's the algebra that I could use. That's the algebra with the carrier type integer, right? And eval is a function that evaluates an arbitrary expression of type fix x per f. That's my arbitrary expression. And it gives me an integer. And it's just doing kata algebra. So, uh, hmm. <laughs> this is a very, very complicated way of, of doing stuff, right? Isn't it? Um, so why would we do that? Uh, because it's very general. Because it's very general. And, and um, you can apply it to any algebraic data type. You can apply it to trees like these. You can apply it to more complex trees. You can apply it to lists. Here's the thing for lists, okay? A list is also an, a recursive data type, right? I can split a list into two parts. One part is this functor that's non-recursive, and the other is my fix, right? So the list functor uh, part is something that actually takes two arguments. One is what, is, what does this list contain as elements? And the other is uh, replacing the recursion in the definition of a list. And the recursion of the definition of, of the list is the tail of the list, right? A list is, is either empty or an element followed by a tail, which is a list. So let me replace this tail with arbitrary type A, and I have a functor, right? So this is the functor. So cons E, E is the element type, A is the tail type, right? But it's a single level list, really. I mean, it's not really a list. It's just uh, like a single level thingy, right? And when I apply fix to it, I suddenly get a regular list of arbitrary size, right? So now, since I have this split between uh, uh, a functor and uh, fixed point, I can say, okay, now I can define an algebra on these lists. So let me define an algebra, let's say, whose, uh, on lists of integers, that, uh, whose carrier type is also an integer. Doesn't have to be, but, you know, just a, a pick. So a carrier type is int, element type is int. It has to return the carrier type, which is also int, right? And it's defined in this way. On nil, it will give me zero. And on this element cons, which has two values in it, the element of a list and this ack. What is this ack? This is the integer that replaced my tail, okay? This is where my recursion was. So it tells me, like, if you know how to evaluate a tail, then just add this evaluation of the tail to the element. So this algebra actually can be used to evaluate the sum of a list of integers, right? And you can apply the catamorphism to this. No, and you get a way of evaluating the sum of a list of integers. And this is exactly equivalent to what, what normally you would call folding a list. This is a right fold of a list. And the right fold of the list, now you see what's happening. It is split into two uh, things because of this function. This function, uh, defines the value for nil, which is zero, right? So it's a const zero. That's this guy. This guy came from here. And this e plus ack comes from here, OK? So this is how my algebra was plugged into this fold.
So here's the conclusion. So I have a very, very general formula for evaluating recursive data structures that works for arbitrary recursive data structure. Data type, I define data types as fixed points of functors in this algebra, right? An algebra for this functor, I have to only say how to evaluate a single level, and the rest just falls out of this, right? And to evaluate a recursive data structure, I will use this catamorphism. And the catamorphism is done once and for all, right? Tested, fixed, finished, it's in my library. I don't have to worry about it. And this is an example of just one of many general so-called recursive schemes. Catamorphism is just one recursive scheme of many. There are catamorphisms, there are anamorphisms, there are hylomorphisms that are, you know, there's like a whole zoo of morphisms. And they are all described in this paper by Eric Mayer and uh, other guys called, uh, what is it called? Bananas, lenses, uh, uh, barbed wire, and, and some other stuff. It's a very funny, funny title. It's an old paper, but it just goes through all these data structures. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yeah. yeah, we have time for questions. Yes? It's actually two questions, but one is, uh, I hope, short uh, answer. The, um, does the algebra have to follow some uh, rules, uh, some laws, uh, or uh, it can be arbitrary for this to work? I mean, maybe it should be a natural transformation to follow function laws uh, both ways? No, no, the, the algebra. Uh, as far as I know, there, there are no rules, anything other than you have a functor, you pick a, a type, and you define a function, a morphism, really. In category theory, you would say it's a, it's a morphism. Is there, uh, okay, is there a relationship between this and free monads? And um, y yes, definitely. Um, I don't know, I, I don't want to go into details, but, but monads uh, um, were, were first invented to deal with algebras, really. You know, it's like every monad defines an algebra. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's either a T-algebra or Eilenberg-Moore algebra. Uh, these are very special kinds of algebras with, which have special properties. Uh, so algebras are more general than monads, but monads are, um, are special kinds of algebras, and, and free monads are, are just things for generating um, algebraic expressions in a free way, sort of, yeah. Actually, free monad is like part of the algebra without the evaluation. It does not really evaluate stuff. It just knows how to accumulate stuff into bigger and bigger trees, right? You need an interpreter yeah, you need an interpreter for this to, to yes. define the algebra, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes? Can you access the left point as a catamorphism? Can you express left fold as catamorphism? I think you can express left fold as right fold. So, yes. <laughs> there is a way of doing this. Anything else? Okay, thank you.